Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My special guest today on the show is S. David Freeman. Mr. Freeman has served as an advisor on energy and the environment to Presidents Johnson, Nixon and Carter. He has a 30-year record as a board member and manager of many of America's largest publicly owned businesses. President Jimmy Carter appointed him as chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1977, where he cut sulfur dioxide emissions in half, stopped construction of eight large nuclear power plants, and pioneered a massive energy conservation program. David Freeman was also Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles for Energy and the Environment, and he's won awards from the Los Angeles Coalition for Clean Air, National Wildlife Association, Global Green, and many other organizations for his devotion to clean air, clean water, and renewable energy. David Freeman, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Well, it's a pleasure to hear your voice and... uh be in uh, at least voice contact with you. Yes, Dave. Um, I want to remind you in the audience how we met. I set up a symposium, oh, I don't know, about eight years ago in Washington, D.C., called Global Warming and Nuclear Power, and you were one of the invited speakers, and we had for two days discussions um, from people on both sides of the issues. Yes, nuclear power is good, it stops global warming, to no nuclear power is no good, and that terrible consequences of global warming and I remember you stood up at the end with your typical southern accent and said we can have all the energy we need in America by 2050 with no coal no CO2 and no nuclear and I said you must be kidding Dave and you said no I'm serious and I thought my god this can't be for real so then I raised the necessary funds and employed your devotee, Arjun Makajani, to do the study called Carbon Free, Nuclear Free, which has become an absolute classic for the future of the United States. Would you like to comment on your statement at that time and how things have played out since then, Dave Freeman? Yeah, well, I think the, you've described it uh, fairly accurately. Unfortunately, Arjun's book, is a classic, but not the policy of the United States of America or any other country right now. So uh, we still have a work in progress. Uh, we've shown that it can be done. What is lacking is the will to make it happen thus far. And and I think that uh, we have to not kid ourselves. The uh, The oil and gas industry seems to be winning the fight at the moment. Uh, the the people on Earth uh, are losing, and uh, and I'm an optimist. I think that we uh, we have developed the technology. We know the policies, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the petroleum industry uh, by amassing such huge quantities of wealth have now developed the technology where they can drill anywhere at any depth, and extract uh, petroleum from the earth uh, and charge enough money to pay for it. So uh, I view the the last 10 years as uh, we've been talking green, uh, we've been going brown, and carbon continues to uh, increase worldwide, uh, 3% this year over last year. We have all these grand uh, programs for doing X by 2030 and that by 2050, but in 2012, uh, we're losing this fight uh, to the oil and gas uh, and coal people, and uh, and I, I my problem is that I'm not sure that everyone in the environmental movement uh, understands that we're getting the stuffings beat out of us, uh, and and I'm trying in in my 80s to try to instill a sense of urgency and passion in a movement that seems to, in America, to have tired blood. Tired blood, that's a good good term, tired blood. Yes, I don't know what happens to people, whether they sort of slip into despondency and depression or practice some form of psychic numbing or when they get to Washington with their NGOs, they sort of start drinking cocktails with the 
DOE and with the State Department and slip into the sort of Beltway Bandit type thinking and and lose perspective, lose the passion, lose the urgency which you so uh, so display. Um, I feel exactly like you do because, I, of course, I'm a physician and I just always think of the planet as a patient and it, it is indeed in the intensive care unit. And after I interview you, I'm going to interview a group of scientists who've just written a paper in Nature magazine saying that things are much, much more severe than they originally thought in terms of global warming and species extinction and the like. And indeed, some of them even admit in interviews that they're, 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 really, they're really, really scared. So for a scientist to say that they're scared, things are getting really grim, aren't they? Well, let me tell you what is uh, cruelly ironic. The greater the evidence is uh, that, that climate change is already having an impact, it, the less we seem to care about it. Here, and I'm speaking about America. I don't really know about Australia or other countries, but we now have clear evidence that the ice is melting. It's melting to the extent that there's now a new Northwest Passage where ships can travel in the summer where they never have been able to for hundreds of years. And the whole Arctic is now open. And guess what? who's about to take advantage of it? The oil and gas people. They found huge quantities of petroleum up there. So the irony is that global warming is melting the ice. The, mel the ice gone is uncovering huge new quantities of petroleum. They charge so much for oil that they have the money to and the technology to develop it. And we keep uh, putting a, a solar panel on a house now and then. And, and, uh, and the carbon globally is going up, up, up when it should be going down, down, down. And uh, in the world seems to be an avoidance behavior. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm trying as best I can. I've moved to Washington, D.C. and uh, getting a few people here. Uh, the one organization that seems to still uh, have fresh blood, not tired blood, is Friends of the Earth. And I'm working with them, and we're now... Uh, seriously involved in trying to keep one troubled nuclear power plant shut down, the San Onofre plant in Southern California, as an example. We figure if we can win that fight, maybe uh, we'll reinvigorate the whole anti-nuclear movement, which should be everyone on Earth, But uh, and you have to keep fighting. But it, it is really ironic that the more we learn uh, that the science of climate change is uh, very much on target, uh, that we, we seem to ignore it more. Yeah. I mean, there was a greater support for doing something about climate five, six years ago when, when Al Gore was making all of his speeches than there is today. Yeah, it reminds me of a cancer patient. You know, when you tell someone they've got cancer and, and you know, it's terminal and they might have, may have six months to live, people respond in, in a variety of ways. Some take it on, they go through their stages of grief, shock and disbelief and then depression and finally adjustment if they have time to do so psychologically. And others totally practice denial. They, do, they don't face it at all. They won't talk about it. They won't talk about dying. And so that's a minority of people, but I think that the majority of humanity at the moment is in that phase. The, oh, yeah. The more severe it is, the less they want to talk about it. Now, is there any way, Dave, that you can get to President Obama? Uh, you know, uh, I, I just feel that he is a man whose uh, interest in... Uh, politics in the smallest sense of the word uh, is overwhelming. I, I don't have the, you know, he is the opposite of Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson had real passion, and he stuck his neck out for the things that he believed in. One of them was terribly bad, the Vietnam War. Others were quite good, the Civil Rights Movement. But he stuck his neck out and got 
deeply personally involved in passing legislation. Uh, Obama seems to me more like the professor in chief, the real cool cat that is just not going to get his own hands real dirty over anything. But can't I mean, you, can't I hope I'm I hope I'm wrong if he wins in his second term. But thus far, uh, if he if George W. Bush had done the things on the environment that Obama's done, uh, hopefully the movement would have been out in the streets yelling and screaming. Uh, but he has uh, come out for the oil industry's energy program, all of the above. Uh, he has uh, publicly rebuked the head of the EPA by ordering her to withdraw a rule on smog that she uh, worked on for the EPA had worked on for 20 years, uh, and he has ignored uh, the largest uh, oil spill in our history and the largest nuclear catastrophe on Earth. And he's for nuclear power, and he's now uh, have the Interior Department just handing out permits like they were Valentine's for oil drilling. Yeah. So, uh, well, you uh, you work, but but I but but let me let me just shift a little bit. All right. While while all that is are is factually true, uh, we have in fact developed the technology that can enable us to become nuclear-free and, and carbon-free, namely the solar and wind technologies and the ability to store power has advanced tremendously. The, the, the problem uh, is that we just don't seem to have the political willpower to fight for it. But the cost of solar panels has just gone down, uh, you know, tenfold. It's now within the range of being economic on the basis of market prices that don't internalize the external costs even. And the wind power, you know, on a day in Texas on Mar in March of this year, 23% of all the electricity was generated from wind power. Hmm. So, so, you know, in Texas, not California in Texas. Uh, so, you know... The technology is there. Uh, we just don't seem to uh, embrace a sustainable future. We talk about it. Uh, I think the the greenwashing is the fastest growing industry in the last ten years. Yeah. As I say, we have talked green, uh, but what? But we're going brown. Uh, I hate to put it that bluntly, uh, but people need to know that in the Environmental movement, uh, with the exception of Friends of the Earth, in my view, died and didn't even bother to have a funeral. <laughs> what about NRDC? They they usually spot on on many things. No, they, 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 they no 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 no. They they uh, the problem with these organizations is they've acquired tunnel vision. Uh, the environmental mm -hmm. community used to be a community. In fact, uh, people in America used to live in communities. Now we live in splendid isolation. And I think if you peel off enough layers, the problem is that in the decade after World War II even, the lingering impacts of the Depression and the feeling of togetherness that we acquired during World War II spilled over for a couple of decades and we were a community, and people cared about each other and, and cared about the things that we could do together. Yeah. Uh, but, but now uh, the people in America view themselves in, as individuals. They've acquired a, an enormous degree of, of uh, materialistic affluence, and uh, there's a big element of victim mentality in people's heads. And, and basically, it's all about how many pairs of shoes you own and uh, how many cars and how many things you have. And it's, it's self-oriented so that uh, people are not instinctively reaching out. People are not instinctively reaching out. For example, President Obama's one big accomplishment, the health care bill. Yeah. He did not sell that on the basis of, of uh, take care of your neighbor. 
of the 30 million that didn't have insurance that we really needed to pitch in and help them get insurance? No, he sold it on the basis that somehow it was going to cut costs and this and that and the other. Uh, there's no one appealing to our humanity and our mm. community sense anymore, and therefore mm. most people have shut that out. They've also shut out government. Ever since Watergate, no one trusts the federal government in America, and indeed the politicians have been running against the government. Remember Reagan famously said, the government's not the solution, it's the problem. Mm. And that that theme is caught on. It's part of the victim mentality that people uh, have to support their own feeling of entitlement. And this is not poor people I'm talking about. These are well-off people that just feel like that they deserve what they have and more and more and more. And indeed, the principal uh, environmental issue, uh, the third rail of environmental politics, the one the 800-pound gorilla in the room is our material growth. Consumerism. That's right, and no one seems to be able to take that on. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are billions of people in this world that need a good deal more consumer growth. Uh, but how much is enough in America and Europe? Uh, and no one even asks that question. And, and no one is proposing, uh, I shouldn't say no one, but uh, certainly... Not many people are proposing a consumption tax uh, to try to dampen uh, the, uh, the the things we buy. I mean, you know, that if, if we just continue on the American path, the material affluence in China and India, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible. We're doomed. We're get, doomed. To get off of fossil fuels in time. That's right. That's right. But we're not setting any example in America at all, uh, you, you know. And what's interesting to me, Helen, also, is that Obama and the Democratic Party have forgotten about the poor. You never mm. hear them talk about protecting the poor. Mm. It's always the middle class, which means uh, the of uh, just promoting more and more material affluence. What are they talking about in terms of the recovery? Everybody wants people to buy more automobiles, uh, build more big houses, and and more uh, this, more, more, more of things. Uh, whereas what we really need to increase is is basically uh, the education process and uh, learn that there is, you know, I, no one is talking about maybe going to uh, – a 30-hour work week so everybody will have a job and we all earn uh, a good deal less and learn to spend more time like you and I are doing right now just talking to each other. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's, it, it, it's fascinating to me how uh, we have grown so much wealthier uh, and become poorer as a result. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You can't pursue happiness. Happiness only comes by serving others and serving the planet. It doesn't come by pursuing happiness. I'm interviewing Dave Freeman, who has been an advisor on energy and the environment to both Presidents Johnson, Nixon, and Carter. And on that note, Dave Freeman, you were uh, a very influential person um, in the Carter administration. You put the solar panels on the White House. You turned the thermostat down. You got Jimmy Carter on television wearing a cardigan. Um, which I'm not responsible for that. that <laughs> which people That's thought his was, PR people <laughs> thought it was in for dig, but and 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 Jimmy Jimmy must still have a good relationship with Obama, can't you? with your contact with Jimmy Carter, get to Obama. What if we both go there? You can do all the coal. Uh, Helen, you can... Helen you're, 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 you're still uh, like a gal that just got out of college with your enthusiasm <laughs> <laughs> and, and feeling that if you, can, if you can just talk to the man. Uh, yeah. let me, let me, let I me... wish I looked like that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me uh, give you a little... Uh, political reality. Okay, okay. Uh, this is a true story. Uh, when a bunch of people came to Franklin Roosevelt 
with the idea of a of a WPA of a government program to create jobs, you know, make trails in the in in the Appalachians in the Appalachians and and do useful things that would create jobs. It's yeah. called the WPA. Yeah. And he 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 looked at them and he sat there for a minute. And he says, you know, this this might might actually be a pretty good idea. Now get out there and make me do it. Make me do it. Yes. In other words, uh, one person whispering in the ear yeah. uh, might be okay if you're talking about the secret of an atomic bomb and, and where Albert Einstein could whisper to Roosevelt and, and make a difference. But this is a political issue, and he needs, Obama needs to hear from millions of people. Mm. Uh, he, you know, he's not, go- and first, second of all, Presidents, by nature, don't particularly like advice from ex-presidents. I mean, <laughs> strangely enough, and uh, and I was with President Carter just a month ago, and I brought up this very subject. And he doesn't have a very high opinion, frankly, of Obama's energy policy, nor do I. And I don't know that they have uh, that close relationship. But Al Gore speaks to Obama too. They. But the thing about it is the guy is a person, let me put it this way, he's sort of Bill Clinton without any passion. (laughs) Uh, He's very, very bright, and he knows what the right answer is. And if it it were politically expedient uh, and somebody else stirred up uh, the, the folks, he would do it, but he is not. A rabble rouser. He's not somebody that's going to stick his neck out for something that's unpopular, and uh, and you can uh, you can hope. And if he gets reelected in his second term, I'm certainly going to try. But here's the right answer, uh, and this is another true story. Uh, when Adlai Stevenson was running for president against Eisenhower, of course he didn't win, but he went to this university and, and he gave terrific speeches, and he gave this speech. And as he was leaving uh, the, the podium and walking out, this woman jumped up out of the audience and she yelled. He was the governor of Illinois. He said, Governor Stevenson, all the thinking people in America are for you. And he said, uh, yes, ma'am, but we need a majority. <laughs> that and really- I, think there, I think there are a lot of thinking people in America that would agree with what we're saying. But we need to get out there uh, at the grassroots level and, and, and with the younger people and, and try to reignite uh, the kind of consumer movement that we had back in the 70s. What we really need, Helen, is a young female version of Ralph Nader. And, and we probably need one in each state. I mean, we don't have in America today the kind of uh, consumer movement that we had in the 70s, when we had uh, Ralph and we had Nader's Raiders and they issued reports every week and, and they were ginning up facts and, and the young people in the country uh, were a part of the political process. The young people in America today have tuned out the political process. They got excited about Obama in 08 and they don't see that he's done that much, <clears throat> at least as far as they can see. It's hard to see to get excited about, you know, uh, the flood that didn't happen and uh, and the fact that it could have been worse. So we got, we got a tough fight on our hands. I'm not saying, and I think we need to be putting an energy policy on the table worth fighting for. Right now, the environmental movement is fooling around with crumbs, and we need to reignite the anti- I think the anti-nuclear movement can be reignited. We need to win a fight or two. We're trying to win one in in uh, Southern California to show that it can be done. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are some young activists that I've met here in D.C. This, this fight is by no means over. Uh, but in order to win it, we have to recognize that right now we're losing. Yep, I agree. And, of course, I, I helped to instigate and lead the movement 
in the 80s against nuclear war and nuclear weapons with my organisation Physicians for Social Responsibility. But the main way that was done, Dave, was actually I had a an agent in Hollywood called Pat Kingsley who represented most of the major film stars at that time. And she would say to Merv Griffin or Donahue or any of them, look, um, I'll give you Sally Field and Lily Tomlin if you'll put Helen Caldicott on too. And no one wanted a boring old female doctor talking about the medical effects of nuclear war, but they did want Sally Field and Lily Tomlin. So she used them sort of as a hook to hang me on. And through that mechanism, I got to speak to millions of Americans. And it's my experience, Dave, that unless you have the media cooperating and you on television, you know, on major television, or and John Stewart, you'd be great on St John Stewart and Colbert and all the rest, or Rachel Maddow, you should be on Rachel Maddow. And me too, and I've just been doing a seven-week speaking tour in the States. Um, and I can turn an audience on like you can too. But... You know, it's only little bits here and there. It's counting the angels on a head of a pin instead of getting to millions and millions and millions of mums and pops sitting before their television sets and educating them, inspiring them to reach for altruism instead of... Yeah, uh, you, 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 could, you, could, you couldn't be more right. And, and I feel like that we're trying to light a fire in Southern California, and we'll get some of the stars involved in that. But if we could win one, yeah. if we in, in, in the process show that nuclear power is dangerous, uh, and fortunately, in, and I think that we have a, a living example of that in this San Onofre uh, nuclear plant, which uh, we are focusing on. Uh, it's right next to an active earthquake fault. Uh, and it's designed for just a moderate earthquake. And now, guess what? You know, what? the Nuclear Regulatory Commission last Thursday, yeah. guess what they met on? You won't believe this. Even you won't believe it. <laughs> the subject of the meeting was 80-year licenses for old nuclear power plants. 80-year licenses? My God, that's from... From the first build up to the, when they have to close, 80 years, my God. Well, will you extrapolate on that, Dave Freeman, and tell us what that means? Well, I, I, if you're not, oh, if you wouldn't want to drive an 80-year-old car, uh, can you just imagine the dangers of taking a nuclear reactor built in 1980 with the design of a Fukushima plant right. uh, that would operate uh, for 80 years, that's to 2060, and next to an earthquake fault. Now, you don't have to be a scientist to figure out that maybe the chances of an earthquake happening in any one year is pretty small, maybe even five years. It ain't gonna happen. But if you have a plant actively operating for 80 years, uh, you're not just rolling the dice. You're practically committing suicide. Yeah. Well, and and not, know. To not, to, not to mention the fact uh, that, uh, you know, if you're 80 years old yourself, you have very good idea of what problems of old age. Now, these plants were designed for half that long. Yeah. Uh, we have no idea what the uh, how the bombardment of these radioactive uh, radioactivity inside the reactor vessel is going to is going to do to the uh, reactor itself over years. We have, I mean, practical things like the insulation on the wires is going to wear out. I mean, uh, we have no it 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 just makes everyone living within a fifty mile radius a guinea pig. While the NRC experiments of how long, how long a radioactive factory can exist without uh, Meltdown. annihilating the population, what? you know, it, it's a form of insanity. Uh, but that's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But who are these idiots? Who who are these idiots? The five people on the on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Where do they hail from, Dave Freeman? What? You know, it, it's a form of insanity. Uh, but that's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. 
But who are these idiots? Who who are these idiots? The five people on the on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Where do they well, hail they, from, Dave Freeman? Uh, well, what you what what you apparently have not, despite all of your exposure to these people, you haven't yet accepted the fact that nuclear power is a religion. Yeah. It is. To these folks, it is a religion, and it is a religion that they believe in with the same passion and lack of any thought as any other religion. Well, uh, well what, what's the reason? Do with, I don't understand but, this. I mean, I know that religion for a lot of people is because they're scared of death, so they want to believe, you know, pie in the sky when you die sort of thing. No, 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 no. It, it, it's what a guilt it? trip. It's a guilt trip. How do you mean? Plain and simple. Well, we started off by dropping the bomb. Yeah. And as soon as Truman heard about uh, nuclear power, he said, we got to make something good out of this. We've done something bad. Now we've got to make something good. So America had a national guilt trip over nuclear power, and that resulted in the atoms for peace. It was Eisenhower's major speech. We mm. spread it all over mm. the world. We, we established... Uh, nuclear power in every country we can think of, including Iran. <laughs> and now now we, we seem to regret it, but the truth of the matter is atomic energy was considered the wave of the future, and it was built on a massive guilt trip, and it is a religion that people, they believe that we just, it's just got to be good. Got to be good. It's got to be good even though it's not good. It's got to be good. <laughs> Facts have nothing to do with it. I mean, have you ever spoken to a, a uh, Orthodox Jew or a, a hard right Christian or any or you know a Muslim of, of extreme faith? Uh, facts have nothing to do with the subject. Yeah, well, and the, and you and you do not get appointed to the NRC uh, unless you kind of drink the Kool-Aid. What about Alison McFarlane, the new chairman of the NRC? Well, she, she, she's a geologist. She slipped by because they wanted to get this other uh, religious person uh, nominated and confirmed again. But four of the five of them are true believers. She may not be. And, you know, they they have a maverick every once in a while. But, it, you know, I learned one thing when I was the head of the Tennessee Valley Authority that was essential to any success I had. You have, if you have a five-person board, you got to learn to count to three. Yes. If you have a three-person board, you have to learn to count to two. Once you get that through your head, everything else follows. And they always have a working majority of true believers in nuclear power at the NRC. A possible exception was when Carter was president, when we had some pretty good people on there. But other than that, it's, it's been a, a closed deck, and it's a very closed deck right now. Four of the five are true believers. So I'm not surprised at anything they do. If it's an unmitigated good, it's going to be an unmade good forever, and it's a sin to shut down the plant. Yeah, you know, it's amazing to me, too, after Fukushima and, and that ongoing absolute catastrophe. There you go again. There you ongoing... go again. You're trying to apply logic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dave. you gotta, you got to know the opposite. you got to know the opposition, my dear. Now... There's there's still a possibility of persuading uh, the 99% uh, with facts, and that's the job that you and I and others have. And, and frankly, uh, I think that Fukushima opened the door again uh, to uh, people talking about the subject, and we feel that if we can make an example of one or two really uh, troubled some plants and get them shut down that we can reignite this movement and we are uh, we are learning that we get more and more people in California you know, concerned but we but it's a hard fight to get into the mainstream media you know do you know who owns uh, CBS and NBC yeah, and NBC, and and NBC, GE, and Westinghouse that's right and they build nuclear yeah. power plants and missiles so, and nuclear weapons so you never hear a discouraging word about nuclear power. But, you know, uh, it, it's a tough fight. That's why people like you and I are in it. That's right. Um, you never took on anything easy. Uh, but 
But you know, in a way, uh, you had a you had reason to feel a real sense of accomplishment, and you still have. I mean, uh, the the weapon side has not gone away, but certainly we made it through fifty years uh, pretty well by luck, uh, sheer luck, sheer luck. Yeah, but but the effort the effort is has been you know thus far you'd have to say more successful than not. And we won the civilian nuclear power battle. No, none were bought for 25 years. That's true. It's just that we got a bunch of, of uh, what I would say, unthinking environmentalists that think that have chosen nuclear power as being uh, a way to uh, avoid carbon, and anybody that would substitute plutonium for carbon is an idiot. Oh, well, that's opinion. a great statement, substitute plutonium for carbon. I'm going to use that. That could be a bumper sticker, Dave Freeman. Well, you can say what you... It's just true. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, but fortunately, I think that we're fighting back now, and we're finding that we can uh, spread the uh, crowd, and our campaign in, in San Onofre is, is attracting more and more uh, attention, and we've kept the plant down for four months now. They can't About, open that plant. It's just too fragile with those steam tubes. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but it, it but it's taken a really serious effort on the part of Friends of the Earth that I'm advising yeah. uh, to to mount this effort, and uh, we now have the utility conceding that they're going to keep it down throughout the summer because they don't know really don't know what's wrong with it, no. <laughs> which is quite an admission. Quite uh, an admission. Yes. Yes. Um, so, Dave Freeman, um, what what do you think would happen to the true believers if there was actually a proper meltdown in America? They they, they that wouldn't that wouldn't change them. It, it didn't. wouldn't change them if if hundreds no. of people were dying of acute radiation illness with their hair dropping out, vomiting and bleeding to death, and then an epidemic of cancer well, five years this, later. This happened in Japan. It didn't. Effect, yeah, but know. I don't think Americans care too much about Japanese, and I certainly they didn't care about Russians. I was on the ABC well, radio. Well, now you 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 phrased your question in a way that I'm answering it in a narrow sense. Okay. Obviously, it would change public opinion in America. Yeah. But you asked me about the true believers. Yeah. Them is the religion. Nothing has changed their opinion. Listen, uh, I come from the Tennessee Valley. I went back down there. Uh, to the TVA board the other day and, and confronted them face-to-face. -face. And I told them that they're just treating this as a religion. They yeah. have facts that show that, that the nuclear plant that they want to build is more expensive uh, than any other things they could do. They're doing it because it's the hometown product and they believe in it. Uh, you know, uh, people like that, uh, but they can be marginalized if, God mm. forbid there were a terrible accident in America. It would, it would change uh, the vast majority of people. But right now, the true believers are very influential mm. because they control all these national labs, which have senators in the West that represent them, and they they have true. It's become a political mantra of the, especially the Republican Party, but there are a lot of Democrats. Uh, pro nuke and they've gotten the cover you know there there is a special place in hell that is reserved for environmentalists that support nuclear power i agree but, because they have they've given a thin veneer of cover to the nuclear industry yeah so that they can say well so and so who used to be in greenpeace uh says that we're clean what's wrong with you buddy i mean it it it, it's it's difficult to uh, uh, you know combat that kind of combination. Well, I'll join Edward Teller in his special place in hell. Yeah, you know, Mister Teller once came to a big meeting in the Tennessee Valley when I was chairman, uh, and uh, Senator Baker had called the meeting, who was sort of a friend of mine. And Teller sat down next to me. Yeah, he didn't say he didn't say hello. No. He didn't say anything. He turned to me and says, Mr. Freeman, I believe that I disagree with everything that you've ever said. 
To which you reply? Those, those were his exact words. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said, yes, I'm very proud of that fact. Well, I'll, I'll like tell that. you a funny story about Edward Teller. I was invited by a southern university, I can't remember which, to go down to debate Teller. And who's the actor who played God or Moses in the film? What was it? Charlton Heston. Yeah. I was to debate Teller and Heston along with Admiral LaRoque and me. And anyway, I said, look, I'll come on one condition that I get the last word. So, okay, that was all right. So I arrived and then Teller arrived later at the small airport and they told him that I was getting the last word. Well, he said he called a special meeting of the board before we were to appear and it was to be televised. And he said, I will take this university down if you <laughs> don't give me the last word. And I thought, bugger you. I'm a female, you did Oppenheimer in, you destroyed him, you're not going to destroy me. And so, uh, you know, I, I would not concede. And the poor old president of the university was slipping on his chair almost under the table, you know. And finally I thought, and he was so pig-headed and obstinate, and I thought, you know, you're really a killer, you are a psychological killer. Anyway, after half an hour, I thought, well, it's only a debate. So I gave way, and and the president jumped up and gave me a huge hug. But um, what I, he was scared of was that I would expose him, and stupidly being brought up to be an Australian lady, I didn't do that, and I should have done it, you know. You, I got a glimpse of how evil this man really was. Well, he, um, he didn't let the truth stand in his way, that's for sure. No, no, no. How did you... Well, Dave, are you a physicist by training? How did you come to no, I'm totally... Not a well, what are you by training? Well, I went... Uh, I'll tell you, it's a lot, not a short story. I uh, went to Georgia Tech yeah. and studied civil engineering and then he good at it. And after four or five years of struggling as an engineer, I went back to, to school and I went to law school and I graduated first in my class. So... My formal training is in civil engineering and law. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, know physicists for what they are. I mean, they're usually very intelligent people who uh, uh, are dedicated to the to their profession, and they're mostly fairly narrow in their thinking. Now, the really brilliant ones are very brilliant, but uh, you know. I always thought that the fusion research program was a welfare program for high energy physics. Of course it is. It's their wet dream. Yeah, and it goes on and on and on and on. So, but, and and you know, I, I at one time I was in the science office uh, because Johnson placed me there to keep me out of politics. <laughs> Why did he want to keep you out of politics? Because he was from Texas and he's an oil man, but he knew that we needed an energy policy, so he hired me to begin to lay out an energy policy uh, for the country. But he didn't want it, and he knew that the oil industry would just tear it apart. And and, and so he was trying to protect me, and he did. Mm. And the interesting thing mm. is that I would then see all, all these, uh, Princeton would come in every spring with, quote, a breakthrough on fusion power, just trying to get more money for their tokamaks up there and all. So I can, I know that these scientists can be ardent uh, lobbyists for their pet uh, projects, and so I treat them as just another bunch of special interests, really. Well, how did you learn about the evils of nuclear power? What, what did you read, or who had an influence on you very early, Dave Freeman? Well, how did you learn about the evils of nuclear power? What, what did you read, or who had an influence on you very early, Dave Freeman? Oh, I, I learned this the hard way. Uh, you, you know, uh, the people say that uh, wisdom comes from experience, and uh, experience comes from lack of wisdom. And I've had a lot of experience. Uh, I started off my life as a... Advocate, uh, I applied for TVA's uh, nuclear program as a young engineer because it was pictured as the wave of the future. And then 
I was one of the first persons in the federal government with an energy responsibility, and I uh, I saw that our research work was just centered entirely on nuclear power. I once uh, called a uh, cross-cutting meeting of uh, all the agencies and showed the director of the budget that nuclear power was getting 95% of our research dollar, and there was nothing on solar and very little even on coal research. It was mostly all nuclear. And he said, well, I can't do anything about it. I'll have to deal with these agencies one at a time. And at that moment, I decided that we needed a, a Department of Energy or we needed some place where we could uh, look at these things rationally. And uh, basically, uh, I got into the Carter administration. And even then, you know, I learned enough to be, I began to be skeptical. I was not anti-nuclear when... Uh, Carter appointed me to the TVA. Really? Uh, but no, I, I wasn't. And initially, we were building this armada of nuclear reactors. I gave John Stennis a letter who tried to stop my confirmation, and I promised him that I would complete the Yellow Creek nuclear plant. And then when I got in there, and after a few years, uh, and we got our conservation programs going, and I realized all of the problems with nuclear power, especially what to do with the waste uh, spent fuel and all, uh, I became skeptical. But let me tell you the thing that really drove me to shut those plants down. I have to be honest. It wasn't uh, the pure safety issue at all. It was it was causing rate increases. Uh, these things were coming in way over budget, and, and our conservation program was working. And I went back to Senator Stennis and told him I had to shut down Yellow Creek even though uh, uh, I'd promised I wouldn't. And he understood. He's a, he was a bigger man than people think. And he looked at my numbers, and he, he said, well, you're right. He said, you got to do it. So I shut those plants down, and I still wasn't, uh, you know, emotionally or any other way anti-nuclear. I just, they just cost too much. And, but then I went to Sacramento, and I, where the people had voted down a plan, and I had the job of decommissioning, and I, I began to realize that this thing was even expensive after it was dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and then the thing that turned me around is in '91, I took a trip to Chernobyl. Yeah. And when and you know seeing is believing. Yeah. When you go out there and you see a tombstone with the names of 10 villages on it, and they're all dead. The land is all dead. And I went out on into that desecrated area, and there were a few old people still living there. When I told them about the ideas of solar power and things like that, and they started crying, it just hit me that this stuff is just unbelievably deadly. Mm. Uh, and, and so after that, uh, you know, I, I began to realize that we were dealing not with something that was too expensive to use, but it was just too dangerous. And and so it was it wasn't Chernobyl itself, but it was going and seeing. And that's why I think if we could get a bunch of people to actually go to Japan and see what's happened, that that might help too. Well Senator Wyden went from Oregon and he was absolutely I know. devastated. Yeah, he had, he he reacted the same way I did to Chernobyl. Yeah, well, there's been a huge cover-up of, of but, Fukushima. But before this hour is over, I do want to say a bit more on the positive side. Please do. But the solar technology is now uh, become nearly cost-competitive uh, with, with fossil fuels. The Chinese are selling solar modules at less than a dollar a watt, and, and I think the price can... Uh, can come down even a bit more. And the large wind turbines, are there, this technology is cost-effective. Uh, we need to get the word out that the renewables on a life cycle basis are, are cheaper, and they're certainly cheaper if you put any value to the survival of mankind on this earth. And uh, somehow or another, in America at least, uh, the the good guys have stopped even making that point. 
I don't hear the words climate change or, or renewable energy uh, being advocated. And uh, so I'm groping for some new ideas. One of them possibly is to get all the green states to form a green compact and, and adopt common laws that would simply... You know, what's wrong with outlawing new coal plants and new nuclear Absolutely plants? Absolutely they should be outlawed. Absolutely. And, and what's, wrong, what's wrong with a law that says when a coal-fired plant gets 40 years old, it, it, it's time to retire? Yep. Uh, and, and that way we can, over, we can make the 2050 go, but we've got to start getting carbon going down this year and next year. Yes. I am impatient with people just adopting big goals 20 years away and oh, doing nothing I am to too. achieve them. Yep. And we've gone through five years of that. Yep. Where we, where, and there's too many people bragging in the environmental movement about what they've accomplished to just get more money out of people when they haven't accomplished doodly squat. Yep. And there's too much tunnel vision of people just having their pet little project and being indifferent to the impact it has. You know, there's so many ironies here. Ecology taught us that everything is connected, yet the environmental movement is is into tunnel vision, mm. and they're they're not they're not a cohesive, uh, united group anymore. That's right. Well, t- and, nu- I, I, and, nu- and nuclear has been is sort of the uh, been put in the closet. Dave, and we're trying to bring it out. Tell but, people how you can store solar power, solar thermal plants, how you can store wind power, because they keep coming up with baseload power, and you can't get that well, from well, renewables. Well, let me tell you, I've run five big major utilities, and a baseload power plant, if, I don't know what language I can use, but it's a pain in the ass. Uh, it runs, all, you have to run it all night long when you don't have much load. Yeah. A util- what a real utility guy wants is dispatchable power, power that you can turn on and off very quickly. Yeah. And, and, and that's not a nuclear plant, and it's not a coal plant. It, it's gas turbines, really, but it's also hydropower. It's also solar and wind. The solar and wind, you will run every minute you can because the fuel cost is zero. Hmm. The marginal cost is zero. And what? What people forget is that Hoover Dam was very expensive when it was built, but today it's one mil power because it's depreciated. It's still working. There's not a solar panel on this earth that's ever worn out. They de- they degrade a little bit, but there's some in SMUD that were built in the 80s that are still doing fine. Uh, and over the life cycle of the plant, as you depreciate the w- solar and wind project, it gets lower in cost, whereas certainly uh, the fossil fuels um, don't seem are, are not going to go get lower, and they and they have fuel costs every time you use them. So we have not made the case for the renewable resources that need to be made with vigor and with knowledge. And a lot of the politicians, seeing that the going has gotten tough, they've got going. Shut up, and they're not pushing it. Do you work? Do you work with James need, Hansen? Do you work closely with James Hansen, Dave Freeman? No, I don't work closely with him. He he is sounding the alarm, and they've been sounding the alarm for some time. What we need are more people that are sounding yes. the positive message that there is an answer. It's an insurance policy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I I go at the climate change a bit different uh, than these so-called experts. I, I tell an audience this, you know, I don't know 100% for sure what the impact of climate is going to be. The scientists say that it's going to have a devastating impact, but I don't know for sure. But neither do you. Now, that makes this a risk. And what does a businessman do when they have a risk? I don't know I'm going to die next year, but I take out insurance in case I might. And we don't, and we have good reason to believe that climate requires it. And the insurance policy will simply clean up the air in the cities and prevent asthma and lung disease and stuff like that. So let's just take out the policy. 
You're you're very inspiring, Dave. We've we've almost reached the end of our time, but you're so inspiring. I want to get on the next plane from Sydney and fly over to Washington DC and work hand in hand with you to uh, evoke this revolution. And I think we could do it. I do. Well, I, I live at, uh, right in downtown D.C. now. I'm 15 minutes from Reagan Airport, 45 minutes uh, from Dulles, so I'll be looking for you. Uh, you can just <laughs> knock on my door at midnight. At any time, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dave, it's been we'll, absolutely... We'll invite, we'll invite Arjun over to chaperone. That's and he can take us out to an Indian dinner. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a great Indian restaurant right around the corner from where I live. Oh, yeah, I love even Arjun, even Arjun said it was the best he'd ever uh, seen in DC. Well, that's very high praise for Arjun. Yeah. Yes. Well, I good think good to talk to you. Yeah, good to talk to you, Dave. So let me know when you're coming. I'll see you. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye bye. Okay, bye. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was David Freeman who served as an advisor on energy and the environment to Presidents Johnson, Nixon and Carter. And unfortunately, I didn't get to ask him about President Nixon, which uh, was on the tip of my tongue, but he talked so much and he was so fascinating that I, I couldn't interrupt to talk about President Nixon. Anyway, thanks for listening today, everyone. It's been great, very a lot of fun and very inspiring. Um, if you want to support us, go to ifyoulovethisplanet.org and please donate because we have to keep going. We have to keep going. This is such an important radio program. Education is the key. As Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. This is about informing. Thanks for listening again. We'll be back with you next week with another fascinating show. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs> 